which uh, talk about the built environment is responsible for greenhouse gas emissions and global warming and indiscriminate use of natural resources, which we already talked about it. And then energy, entire construction process is extremely energy intensive and carbon uh, oriented. Now, how do we actually, what exactly are the mitigation strategies? Before we actually get onto the slide, how do we evolve it? How do we evaluate it? What exactly are the mitigation strategies? We have only two responses possible to the global warming or the climate change. One possibility is that we keep accepting the change as it is happening right now. Sustainability gets actually the last priority among all the things, and we only talk about it. We really don't practice about it. We need to practice about it, otherwise we keep going like this, we keep adopting, we keep seeing the changes, and just imagine what, what's going to happen if we do not. Population is, of course, one of the important reasons. And second, actually, mitigation possibility is actually whether can we contribute something in mitigating this to this criteria, to this humongous challenge that, that what we have in front of us. It is beautifully given by the previous speaker uh, in, in respect of concrete. I would like to extend the same thing. And what is the way forward? The way forward is actually the decarbonization. You have three what minutes, sir. Oh, I <laughs> OK. Uh, as I said, sustainability always gets a last priority. <laughs> so this decarbonization e is actually the thing. And we need to talk about energy efficiency, low carbon footprint, et cetera. And I would like to skip these things uh, because how do we, uh, let me come to the main aspects of it. We, because the previous speaker has already done it, we have a lot of ways and means as engineers we can adopt to this decarbonization. And I, when it actually comes to the urbanization part of it, we just cannot blame everything to the urbanization or the rural migration that shifts. That actually what is important is uh, we, we need to understand there is a terminology called environmental refugees. These are the people who migrate from rural to urban because of uh, there may be a dr drought condition, there may be volcanic, there will may be El Nino effects, etc. There are many reasons for which we need to understand why this rural migration is happening. Let, let me quickly go through this sustainability evaluation. Now there are essentially four types of evaluation which are possible. One is the life cycle analysis of material which is applicable for materials and then buildings. And this essentially talks about the impact of embodied energy and then embodied carbon. And then second, we have sustainability development indices which are actually developed for the uh, local conditions. And third one is actually, there is an interaction based uh, evaluation which I just showed you, I1 plus I2 plus I3. Those are actually evolved for condition basis. Now the next one is the green rating systems. Now these green rating systems have actually played enormous role in the, sir, I, I need another five minutes because the next five slides are very, very important. And at least give me those 20 minutes what you have promised. So now this is extremely important. Green rating systems have played an extremely important role. But let us as engineers understand one important thing. Green rating systems, there are about 64 green rating systems all over the world. And these green rating systems are all criteria based. You do this, you get so many points. You do this, you get so many points. You do this, you get so many points. If you don't do this, you don't get points. Simple. Now, they do not incorporate the mainly for engineers, the properties of engineering materials are most important. They do not take into account the material properties. They have done extremely well. They have done their job, but we need to go a step forward. And that is how I will quickly, suppose we have a evaluation method where before we actually take up the construction, I am, in, I am able to classify my building on the design table, on the at the, in the conceptual stage. Suppose if I am able, depending on the real time data, that is the bill of quantities, whether my building is non-sustainable, least, moderately sustainable, etc. With these conditions in picture, if I'm going to have it, I can actually play wonders. I can play alternative materials, alternative technologies, alternative methodologies, etc. This is the case study which is very important for students actually. This is the case study which we have done. For example, urbanization, because urban scenario is done, 
uh, almost about one of the case studies I've taken, 18 floors, which is a RCC frame, total area is about 250,000 square feet, solid concrete walls, etc., which is a typical RCC framed construction, which, and I have tried to evaluate this using the interaction methodology because all the embodied energy, embodied carbon come into the picture. The entire real-time data bill of quantities can be split into these, uh, this manner, and for each, we can calculate the total embodied energy, for example, in the last column. We can identify, and this particular building, what we saw, is tells us about, it says about 5,185 uh, megajoules per square meter, and this is the type of gra graph we can play. And please note here that concrete and steel and formwork play an absolutely important role. Now, what exactly it means? What exactly do I mean by 5,200 megajoules per square meter? It actually me means that if, we, if you multiply it by the total area, it gives me approximately 13 crore megajoules is the energy consumed by that one building. If you want to convert that into commercial rate at the rate of rupees eight per unit rate, it is almost equivalent to 29 crores of rupees equivalent energy is consumed by that one 18 story building. If the base value is about 3,500 3, megajoules is for the typical, we need to try 5,200 megajoules to 3,500, which saves approximately a cost of about nine crores of rupees. It may not be possible to bring down to 3,500 because it's the benchmark value. Even if we achieve 50% of it, it can be almost to the tune of about five crores in one building. Similarly, we can actually identify and calculate the embodied carbon into it. And then from the embodied carbon perspective also, the similar thing can be drawn. And the figure shows about 487 kilo kg CO2 equivalent is the embodied. And what does it actually mean? It actually means for the entire building, it is almost about 12,200 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent is emitted, greenhouse gas is emitted into the atmosphere. If you really want to convert that into equivalent commercial picture, it almost amounts to about 10.39 crores. What it, it, it means that approximately we have burnt a coal worth of 10.39 crores for this particular one building. And this is in important data for civil engineers once we have that. And these are the interaction equations and this is the mathematical model which can be identified, which can actually. And I would like to come to the third and last uh, uh, interaction method which I talked about, ASP, SDI method, which incorporates everything. And this particular method incorporates not only embodied energy, not only embodied carbon, but also takes into account the other 22 uh, indicators and then engineering properties into consideration. And we can actually identify, take the uh, number of di uh, typology, di different buildings, different typologies, and calculate embodied energy per square meter, embodied carbon per square meter, and then the sustainability development index can be actually uh, expressed in terms of percentage, and for this, the benchmark value, it, be, it becomes more and more. So by applying standard deviation and other means, uh, statistical means, we actually, for building specific building typologies, we can actually arrive at this kind of, and once we do this for a particular typology of building, we can actually analyze every building in what way. For example, this particular, you see the dotted lines which are there, actually, the dotted line is the mean uh, uh, embodied, I mean embodied energy. This is from the embodied energy perspective. So 5.19 gigajoules per square meter is the, this thing. So standard deviation, we have that. And we can actually place all the projects into these actually four categories, sustainable, non-sustainable, and what we discussed. Similarly, from embodied carbon perspective, we can actually place this, uh, the identify which is sustainable project, which is non-sustainable project, these things can be done. Similar thing can be done actually for the materials. Formwork actually is one of the most neglected materials and that is why I have taken this. This method can be applied even for by analyzing formwork system. These three formwork systems have been taken, aluminum, plywood and conventional. And we come to know that 
aluminum framework is actually most sustainable. It may have high embodied energy, but in terms of repetition, in terms of its uh, repeatability, in terms of recyclability, in terms of reusability, in terms of its lightness, in terms of its handling, etc., etc., it actually scores over all the other material. Yes, there is a limit within which we need to, there is a minimum square feet or square meter of area which is required. I think uh, I have almost come to an end. These are some of the imp important uh, projects where, United Nations projects where I'm involved with. Uh, just to give you a picture, how an RCC, this is a, of course an RCC framed building which is almost uh, come. In conclusion, diversity in a planet's ecosystem is the foundation of human life. In that perspective, we need to ensure the rights of the future generations are not compromised while meeting our needs. Civil engineering projects have evolved from time to time, responding several natural calamities. For example, seismic is one of the important cal natural calamities to which we have responded, included in our codes. And similarly, we need to include uh, global warming and then climate change into our daily. And we have the methodology which is now available. And it is for students, I think this is one of the most promising area and this is one of the need of the hour which we need to take up. I, I want uh, students to take more and more responsibility, go in depth and we once again giving a clarion call to all the civil engineers. Let us not call, be happy with calling ourselves as nation builders, let us also take the responsibility in what way construction industry is contributing to the detrimental effect of on to the planet. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Ajit. Uh, I request uh, M. N. Ramesh to kindly hand over a bouquet. And uh, you have been given full 20 minutes, Ajit. On a lighter note, uh, eight minutes extra. Thank you very much. That is because you said sustainability evolution in the beginning. So <laughs> I took. We have uh, engineer S.V. Chandramauli. Uh, he is uh, a structural and structural health monitoring consultant. He was formerly working for Saukar Finland. He has worked on Russian projects. He has submitted his PhD, all the best for it, and uh, currently working, he is also continues to work with Russian authorities. Uh, metaphysics as science and vibrations as science and also as well as spiritual is his uh, area of interest, strange, but uh, Chandramoli, the stage is yours. Uh, we have uh, one more speaker who would tell you the actual scenario of uh, the government works and how does it go about with concrete. Dr. Arvind Galabali. Uh. Thank you. Good evening, one and all. Uh, my topic is uh, quite uh, simple, and the talk, uh, the presentation also is very simple because the time is up, and everybody wants to move. And when this time is very short, what we call as what we need is better performance assessment technologies such as the sensing systems. So I'm going to concentrate on sensing technology for structural health monitoring of highway concrete structures. Um, we know that the road infrastructure is vital for the economy. So, and it also needs 
a lot of modernization. We have been seeing the uh, previous uh, speakers uh, emphasizing more on the disasters or the remedial measures also. Now we are in a race uh, wherein the, we are the largest road networks, okay? And we have already crossed 60 lakhs kilometers. And now we are, we are in, the, in the financial year 2017 and 18, we have been constructing uh, the ro uh, road uh, infrastructure at a rate of uh, 28 kilometers per day. And whoever is our ministers or whoever is our prime ministers, definitely this rate will never come down. It will never come down. So you see a large potential. So that means there is increase of speed that is required. I'll just skip, mo I'll skip most. And uh, in the recent uh, years, Indian Ministry of Road Transport have decided to, uh, to move towards rigid payments as a default mode of construction on national highways. So if this is a case, that means you have to look into the life cycle cost of the entire road infrastructure. The life cycle analysis uh, components are uh, lifespan, cost, uh, and benefits. If you look into it, if you analyze the life cycle cost, the rigid payments have proven to be more economical. Uh, the payment industry is also one of the largest economy and material consuming industry in the world. So the concrete has been ever evolving. So there is a lot of uh, uh, developments in it. And we have seen most of the different type of concrete that has got better capabilities and characteristics. Okay, irrespective of it, the structures that are uh, designed uh, initially will degrade with time, will undergo deterioration with time, irrespective of the materials used. Even though it is designed as per the standard codal provisions, with time, the deterioration increases or it could also be uh, uh, reducing. If it is being subjected to very harsh environment, it could also get accelerated. The deterioration can be further accelerated. And we all know that the loading is never constant. It is always varying. And if this, there is va variability and uncertainty, the probability distribution functions are the best to be represented. And if you stake up at any time, point of time in future, you will never be able to balance the demand and the capacity. So from this, we can easily make out the time varying probability of failure is increasing with time. In order to understand the sensing technologies or the deteriorations, we need to understand technically what does these definitions mean. Deterioration is a process of deteriorating or the process of damage. Now what is damage? Damage is defined as a change introduced in the system. It is a change in the state from before and after. Uh, that can adversely affect its current as well as future performance. But damage does not necessarily imply the total loss so the key components are the structure itself, um, it, uh, which has to be monitored, the sensors, the acquisition system, data transfer and storage systems, data management, and data analysis. The sensor is a device for sensing a physical variable, as we all know. The key parameters are monitored by employing such sensors at strategic locations. But what to be noted is that any sensor does not me measure damage. But we use the sensor data that is in the time history form, which represents the different states. When you, know, when you compare it between two different states, any change which is, uh, which is varying, that is either it can be increasing or decreasing, can represent a damage. Sensors are available in various forms, electrical, mechanical, electromechanical, as well as these days fiber optics. But these can be also, sensors can be also classified based on installation. It is surface bonded, glowable, surface weldable, clampable, boltable, concrete embedded, and composite embedded. So these sensors can be connected, uh, can be uh, placed onto the structure at strategic locations, and this can be connected to the data acquisition system, which acquires the data from the sensor. And this can be parallel. It can be connected in parallel or you can have the signal conditioning units very close to the sensor and then connect it, interconnect it with a single wire. Every sensor or every type of uh, data acquisition system that is distributed or the parallel system has its own pros and cons, but this is being developed and implemented across the globe. Recently, every sensor node can be made wireless with the development and as well as progress in the science and technology. There is a lot of uh, innovative uh, things that can make it more reliable. 
So this is one of the latest which is being implemented across the globe. The networking of sensors can be wired or wireless. It can be fully wired or it can be distributed, wherein you have a same num type of sensors which are interconnected or a cluster of sensors that of different uh, type of, uh, uh, that measures different type of physical parameters are measured. Or it can have fully wired uh, wireless uh, sensor networks. The continuous monitoring of any structure uh, helps us to measure what is the state of a st uh, structure. And it can be done at any stage. It can be done at any stage uh, during construction, in service, after renewal, and during uh, retrofitting measures also, during and after retrofitting measures have been done. Though my topic is basically revolves around uh, the, uh, uh, the concrete and uh, the monitoring of concrete. So on uh, particularly applied to highway infrastructure, there is a lot of uh, literature that is available and a lot of projects has been done. So here it gives a summary of existing and potential sensor based uh, SHM uh, applied to highway infrastructure. Now, there are a lot of uh, challenges uh, when it comes to road infrastructure. The challenges are these payments are continuous and a lot of, uh, we have seen in the previous slides that uh, previous uh, speakers have uh, emphasized more on this. But what is very important is that if in case we are able to monitor the early strength, uh, it can help in the speedy construction, which is, uh, which is uh, presently on demand, we need to do it. Uh, but it has to be safe. That means if we measure early uh, age strength, we can, uh, we can progress, the construction progress can be speedy and as well as safe. But the crucial factors are for, for the uh, early stra age strength gain are that the time, temperature, relative humidity, and the moisture content. Uh, there has been a lot of practice in structural health monitoring. Uh, most of these structural health monitoring is based on vibration-based. Uh, most of my projects were on vibration-based, but uh, few of the projects wherein we have incorporated other sensors are also helping the engineers to get data relevant to the, uh, their research or uh, their findings. So one of these is the monitoring the temperature. When it comes to mass concreting, the monitoring temperature uh, plays a crucial role in large infrastructures. And the present day, when we are talking about the concrete innovations, what is required is calculating the uh, concrete maturity, which has been quite accepted uh, worldwide, and uh, it is also based on standard procedures, which is laid out in ASTM. And as well as tracking of hyd uh, hydration, tracking uniformity, time finishing activities, these are the things that can be uh, monitored using temperature sensors. So also when you are monitoring temperature, uh, it is also required for you to require uh, the moisture content or the relative humidity because uh, most of the curing takes place the, uh, on the field using uh, the moisture, uh, the water. Uh, so we, uh, this is where this plays a crucial role also and a uh, lot of uh, payments uh, have uh, been uh, 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 go undergone damage because of this entrapped water also, because we are into the generation of permeable concrete, so wherein the water is allowed, but what happens beneath is a uh, is big question mark, and that can be monitored using this type of sensors. So we have these sensors, but this is me not implemented. The reason is very simple, it's quite costly. So even though this is quite uh, helpful, the engineers have been uh, not uh, okay with this because of, these, uh, because of the cost, mostly because of the cost. But the, the recent days, the, the frugal engineering concept of the, or the, uh, uh, the internet of things and uh, uh, do-it-yourself projects have enabled uh, the development of uh, uh, these type of uh, monitoring systems, that is concrete monitoring systems, at a lesser cost, uh, say about uh, $10 to $20, we can get a nice uh, 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 monitoring systems done. And this, uh, this, this I'm go what I'm going to emphasize is a, a project that was done for the Vietnamese, wherein uh, they asked us to monitor the temperature of the concrete for uh, because the consultant had his own reasons to monitor that. So what we have done is we have developed this census, and this is easily developed by any of the electronic uh, engineers, and this was able to uh, provide them the data in real time. So these are the census. Uh, we are also providing this type of census. So, but with these sensors, okay, now we know that we have sensors that can monitor not just vibration, we can also put in other sensors that are required for your project, and we can also make it cost effective. But, is the, uh, bec but the real issue is the, the civil engine structures are quite large enough. So when it is large enough, you, have, you require more number of sensors if in case you are more concerned with the damage analysis. So, or if in case 
you have the, uh, you want to uh, look into the damage, the time taken for any damage to progress takes a long duration. So you need to have a continuous monitoring system. So there are two reasons or two issues that we face when we are using such type of systems, simple systems, that is the deployment uh, of sensors, that is number of sensors that is deployed onto the structure or the frequency of monitoring. Furthermore, if in case, if in case there, there is, because these sensors are so tiny that localization, yeah, they, have, they have the issues of localization. So you are not, you need to have a prior understanding of where the damage is in order to put the sensor in realistic structures. These are the two limiting factors of the, uh, the uh, discrete monitoring system that is available in the market or you can try it out. Uh, but this can be overcome, but these, uh, the, the recent days we have moved to nanotechnology, uh, materials uh, based on nanotechnology, and one of it is uh, the self-sensing concrete, uh, which is the most promising in embedding, uh, uh, embedding SHM uh, systems. Uh, this is based on the nano, uh, uh, nanotechnology or the nanomaterials, uh, which helps into converting your structure or the, uh, the element itself smart, or it has the sensing capabilities. So it, uh, in particular, this, uh, this uh, uh, smart cementitious uh, material, which can, be, uh, which can be used as sensor itself, has both resistive and capac uh, capacitive characteristics and self-sensing ability uh, for both dynamic as well as static loading. Uh, but also uh, this nanotechnology has been improving, uh, uh, has been uh, impro uh, improves the du durability and ductility toughness as well as uh, uh, controls crack growth in the nano levels. Uh, most of the experiments that is conducted which I'm uh, involved, uh, they have been using nano carbon tubes and these nano carbon tubes are uh, highly conductive and this being used extensively, but these are not being experimented on this particular aspect that is self-sensing of concrete. So the, uh, as I said, that the carbon nanotubes are uh, being extensively used because of its high aspect ratio, superior electric conductivity. It is out about 1,000 times that of the copper, if it is uh, electric conductivity as well as thermal conductivity, it's almost higher, as well as it has the excellent uh, uh, tensile strength. But the issue is when you're using such type, it is similar to these fibers, carbon fibers, which we're using earlier, uh, this, it's dispersion. Dispersion is very important criteria that uh, that we, wherein you can, uh, en, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, utilize this type of materials. If, the, it, if the, there is a good dispersion, uh, it has got a good conductivity and we call it as percolations. The percolations and the resistance comes as low, uh, less as, for, I mean, as low as possible. That is the electric conductivity increases. And if there is a bad dispersion, the resistance is quite high and it doesn't uh, put conductive. So if you see the graph towards the uh, right, you can see that there is a, the measurement of the, uh, the nanofibers content, uh, nano, nanotube con uh, content in percentage, and the electric conductivity. The, uh, you, you, the amount of uh, nanotubes that needs to be added into the uh, uh, concrete is an issue, and uh, that can be found when there is a steep rise in electric conductivity. And there you can find out a threshold at which the percolation is perfect. So at this point, the uh, the nano, um, uh, then, uh, the cement based, uh, cement based material, that is, uh, sorry, nanotechnology based uh, materials are not just electric, uh, good at electric conductivity, but it is also good in uh, capturing the strain. Okay, it's quite sensitive to it. So it becomes, uh, well, it becomes almost similar to that of the strain. So if you are uh, aware of the concept of strain gauge, if you measure uh, the electric uh, resistance between any two uh, points and you can uh, find out uh, the straining capabilities of the uh, material. Similarly, if in case you have a nano fib uh, nano tubes um, uh, dispersed into the well dispersed into the concrete element, and we have two electrodes and measure the resistive, uh, resistivity between these two, and as we know, the relative difference of resistivity is directly proportional to the uh, uh, strain. So this can this type of uh, technology has been already uh, into research, and there is a lot of uh, numerical modeling and it can be also incorporated in a lot of uh, finite element analysis packages, and it has been reported in various uh, um, literatures. And this, uh, this is similar to various other uh, uh, 
uh, uh, fabrication, pro uh, similar to the other fabrication process, what is done in the industry. It's quite simple. It is uh, based on the uh, additives, uh, that is nano, uh, uh, nano material additives that is added into, that is carbon uh, nanotubes, in particularly multi-walled uh, carbon nanotubes are being utilized here. And that can be mixed with the, uh, the concrete itself. And then you have the, uh, you, uh, after the, uh, the, you pour into the molds, and then you can uh, insert your, uh, uh, the electrodes uh, in order to measure the resistivity. If these cubes are placed uh, into the, uh, the elements, we this three minutes, sir. That's okay. Uh, if these, uh, ele these sensing uh, cubes can be put into, and there is a connection uh, to be, uh, that can be done, it can convert the inert payments into a smart se uh, self-sensing payments. And this is uh, beds. And if in case, uh, uh, if in case we implement it, the benefits are uh, limitless. That is, the application possibilities are limitless, as I said, that is self-monitoring, weigh in motion application, detection of human uh, beings. That is, when, you're, when this is implemented across the zebra crossing, we can know that when to uh, allow the traffic and when not to. This can be utilized. And you can also classify based on the strain uh, readings. The sensitivity and accuracy of uh, detection are adequate for outdoor and indoor security. So in the concluding, uh, uh, SHM is matured and I had, uh, made the transition from research to practice. Motivation for structural monitoring of highway structures uh, yeah. is purely economics. It's purely economics because it uh, it's, uh, reduces the life uh, cost and uh, it, uh, life cycle cost. And although the traditional sensors are quite costly, but still uh, their maintenance is also costly, but still it can help, uh, help in reducing the life cycle cost of the whole entire infrastructure going to monitor across this, uh, we are going to monitor this change in state. So the sensor cannot ma uh, measure damage. That's a very important thing. And we can't do uh, any uh, structural health monitoring projects without sensing. So there should be a sensor, uh, but the sensor cannot measure damage, but the data from the sensor can be processed, the data can be processed to the information, and then we can find out whether there is a damage or not. The traditional uh, sensor based uh, uh, has its own uh, limitations. That is, uh, it is quite uh, small and very, very tiny. And there could be an issue with the localization. Uh, that means if in case uh, uh, you, uh, you, need to, uh, you need to find a uh, damage, that means you need to know the priorly where the damage is. And you need to put uh, the uh, vast amount of uh, uh, sensors. And that has to, sometimes it has to be wired because of the electrical issues. and uh, the, the, the most of the time, these traditional sensors have the problem of uh, surviving in that harsh environment. So, so the present day, the cement-based sensors uh, with nano material fillers, such as uh, the carbon nanotubes as well as carbon nanofibers, transform traditional concrete into uh, inertly smart concrete with multi-function sensing properties. The smart uh, concretes are potentially improving the current uh, state of development of SHM technology by overcoming some of the main limitations which I've already told. Research to fabricate multifunctional, I'm talking about multifunctional, it has got its own meaning. You can, uh, you can look into several literatures, you'll get to know the definition of it. Because of time constraint, uh, I'm not able to explain more. Research to fabricate multifunction self-sensing uh, cement-based materials using nanoparticles is still in the early stage. It's been uh, implemented in the academics. It is also put in the prototype projects, but it's not put on the real structure still. Uh, it's in still in the experimental stage. So nevertheless, the current research results show a significant potential of this technology. So I thank you one and all. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Umesh, uh, I will disturb you to hand over a memento and bouquet. Uh, we have now Dr. Arvind Galigali, uh, who is uh, an advisor to government of Karnataka. Uh, uh, he is a product of BBB Technological University, and he has an MTech and PhD from IIT Kanpur. Thank you, Chandra Modi. Dr. Arvind Galagali has been in the teaching profession for more than 30 years, and he also was a consultant along with that. 
and he has got 10 years with government of Karnataka as an advisor. Uh, he has traveled extensively, delivered lectures across universities in US, US and Europe. Along with that, I know one thing about Arvind Galgali. Uh, once upon a time when I used to know him very early, it was like, you, ne you need an electrical tower, you, need, you should go to Arvind Galgali for the best results. Uh, I, I don't know how many lakhs of uh, electrical towers he has designed. Arvind Galgali, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Nagesh. It's very nice of you for uh, talking so nice about me. Friends, a uh, few good uh, news for you. This is the last lecture. And uh, I'm very happy that the last lecture is given to me because I come from a teaching fraternity. Last 30 years I've been teaching in university. And being a teacher, we know how to extend the presentation or how to compress the presentation based on the time availability and based on the student's mood. Secondly, we also know how to make lecture more complicated or simple the way it is. And believe me, I'm not going to take even 20 minutes uh, because you are already in the mood to run out of this uh, four walls. Since morning you have been listening, being bombarded with a lot of innovations. But my lecture, believe me, is very simple. No mathematical equation and uh, the focus, what I'm trying to do in my, uh, my next 10 minutes presentation is banking upon two, three things. The previous uh, speakers have already set my, the stage for me. One, they talked about the sustainability, and the other uh, person just generally talked about the structural health monitoring. And the third one, the whole conference is on the innovation. What I'm trying to do in my uh, next few slides is how to design a structure which is more sustainable. And one of the things what uh, we could see in the previous presentation is use less of cement. Means use less of concrete. So if you really want to use less of concrete, how do you really make a structure more sustainable by consuming less quantity is one of the focuses what I'm trying to show. Second one, the health monitoring. Why do you want to really monitor the health? Create something what is more healthy right in the beginning. So. Particularly when I deal with an irrigation structure, we deal with water. And you know water is a friend as well as an enemy to the concrete structure. You cannot use more water, you cannot use less water. So really it's a very problematic and more so water is being controlled by a non-engineering person who works on the site. All that he controls the water is looking at the mix, oh, one more bucket or one less of bucket. This is how things being handled in the concrete. So the presence, more or less, is really making a difference for the health of the concrete. So how do we really make about it is my third focus. And the innovation, I'm not talking about something more innovative about it, but I'm being in a government, how innovatively you can apply the available technologies to solve the problem. This is what is my focus in the few slides. And for the benefit of some of my students, who are already there, uh, some of these challenges which are very mundane and uh, most of you know about the construction industry and more particularly in the government and more particularly in the irrigation department we have been facing all these problems. There is always a time overrun. None of the projects that started any time will never complete within the tender period or within the specified period of time. Always they overrun. Why is this overrun? Why we are unable to not complete the entire allotted work within the specified time? How do we really control this time overrun? The second one is, as there is a time overrun, because some of you must be knowing about uh, the projects which have been running over more than 40 years, particularly in irrigation. Even a simple structure like an aqueduct or a wire duct will take mo more than two and a half or even three years. Why this is happening? How do we really? address the innovation to solve these kind of problems. Cost, if the time overrun, it will always attract the cost overrun. And uh, in uh, field, it is very difficult to control the quality because particularly in the government sector, it is uh, uh, the, the system does not have an inbuilt mechanism, particularly in the irrigation structure. Because all the irrigation structures are not built like PWD structures where in a, in a, in a city or in an urban area, all our structures will be lying somewhere deep in the forest, somewhere away from the main uh, habitat, where nothing, even no water, no roads, nothing is available. So how do you really address these quality issues? And maintenance at least is very bad in uh, engineering uh, uh, departments. 
And the fourth difficulty, what I faced, particularly in the government uh, experience, is resistance for a change. The moment you try to bring in some amount of innovation, there is always a resistance from every quarter. Be it a contractor, be it a government officer, be a finance department, everybody will say, why this innovation? We have been used to a traditional way of doing the thing. Why not continue it? So this is one of the greatest challenges what I faced being a part of the government in the last uh, eight to 10 years. So how do you really apply the innovative technologies to address these problems? Unless the innovation helps in bringing up, uh, solving these problems in the real life, I feel the innovation would not root justice to any of these problems. I would take an example, throw one design, how all these characteristics can be achieved in the design and construction now of a wire duct called uh, in, in near Bijapur in Karnataka by name Tidagundi Wire Duct. Why I'm taking this example is when the 2013-14 when we started our uh, interaction with the government, all the structures, I'm just showing you one example where a simple structure of an aqueduct which is just about three and a half uh, kilometers which is built over a dome aqueduct took almost more than two and a half years. And you look at the cross sections, scaffolding required and the span what you see is uh, hardly anything particularly in the today's uh, innovations. You can see this, this is after completion and look at the supporting structure, how strong it is, how many, you know, you can even build uh, a few more structures over that. So this is the kind of wastage, large amount of usage of concrete uh, which we are contributing to the deterioration of the environment at large. So how do you really overcome these problems? Through your innovative design, innovative applications of the available technologies. That is what is uh, trying to be done in design of a wire duct. And there are some specific challenges what we focused in the site because site is highly undulating and the ground level starts from somewhere about five meter where you end up getting the pier height. And as you go deep down, it varies from 10 meters, 20 meters, up to even 30 meters. So it is a kind of deep gorge and 60% of the area is really running under a huge uh, a pier height requirement in carrying out this uh, elevated wire duct. The second constraint is uh, the time because the total length uh, is 15.5 kilometer and at the end of my presentation you would see that this is one of the biggest, I should say biggest, uh, the longest uh, elevated uh, wire duct in the country as on date. So how do you really do that? Then what are the design constraints? Because you know in the government sector uh, the traditional way of handling the thing is whatever is the available formwork, keep using the same formwork repetitively throughout the life of the contractor. So constructability whatever we, pro we promote, whatever we suggest, whether it is being uh, able to construct on the site and what is the cost effectiveness, what is the durability and maintenance and at the same time because this was running very close to the uh, Bijapur city which is a historic city, even aesthetics was a concern. So these were some of the, some of the uh, uh, conditions on the site for which we need to be thinking of innovative application of the technologies. What did you do? How do you really solve what the problem when the ground is varying, when time is a constraint, when the quality is an issue? How do I really address all these three issues? One, as in the Vivek Naik was addressing in his inaugural address, he was talking about the precast structure. So the one of the best solutions that you can save time is the precast. So we started two available technologies of uh, precast technology for the superstructure. And the second one, the health monitoring. You know that irrigation structure, once it is deteriorated because if, even if there is a small leakage, you know water finds its way through and it leads to the corrosion, spalling of the concrete, deterioration, and more so when the maintenance is very bad in the field. So under this condition, we thought the technology available is the precess concrete, where the entire concrete structure is in compression and there is no tension at all. And when there is no tension, there is no possibility of any cracks whatsoever. And this is what a technology was innovatively applied in the design of uh, a wire duct at Tirgundi. Okay, what were the uh, things we did on the site? Because we need to educate our contractor because we have to fight the war with the same soldiers. We cannot really get away. Change the contractor, change the engineers who are available in the field. So educate them, build the capacity about the technology which is being built. It is the first of its kind because we, we went for the pre-tensioning, which is unlike of any of the things what you have been seeing. And the, the whole concept was derived from 
the elevated metro where in, you are all familiar in the metro construction they have gone for the segmental construction where each unit is maybe about 2 meter and 2 meter and later on they went for the post tensioning but in this particular thing what we decided is the segmental construction may attract a kind of maintenance and the leakage of water so we decided to construct an entire span as a single unit and for that we went for pre-tensioned single unit for the entire span. So, and as we are going for a pre-cast, we required a casting yard, one, and after casting, the second one is you have to transport it to the construction site. And our design was governed even by the weight lifting capacity, the availability of the cranes. We traveled across the country and few of the renowned uh, crane suppliers, we discussed with them, and the maximum capacity available was 500 metric ton. You know, and even when you have the, because our ground condition required about 30 to 32 meters, when you have a telescopic boom, they said, sir, though we have a capacity of 500 metric ton, we can only lift about 150 or maximum 200 at the height of 3, 30, 35 meters. So that was another constraint. So all these constraints really uh, forced us to arrive at the geometrical consideration of our structure. So what we did is our uh, trough went for precast on the precasting yard and weight not increasing beyond 250 metric ton because the maximum capacity was 125, 150 tons. So we decided to use two cranes, one at each end of the entire span so that we are in a position to lift with a maximum capacity of 250 metric ton. So that was one constraint. So because of that constraint, we restricted the span which turned out to be through our preliminary designs as a 30 meter. Then uh, the other materials uh, uh, is we used for M50 grade of concrete because we wanted to save time because we wanted to complete well before the tender period. So three days strength we required about M35 grade. So we really went for M50 and you know that M50 conventional concrete is extremely difficult. So we resorted to GGBS thereby contributing towards the global uh, warming as you listened to in the previous uh, lectures. So other structure, we went for uh, FE 500D reinforcing steel and uh, grade 270 conforming to ASTM standards, the pre-tensioning steel. And this is one span what you could see here because the entire span what you see there is a single unit which is varying from maximum about 30 meters but in between where there is a change in the alignment of the canal then we went for a shorter about 25 meter, 20 meter, 18 meter and bends also were done cast in situ. These kind of things were tailor made, but the maximum span was 30 meter, which was a single unit weighing 225 metric ton, where we had two cranes, which you could see in the few of the following slides. And you can see the, the tapering of pier, which was cast in situ, and there also we went for the, the slip form, uh, this thing. And this is what you can see, the trough. Trough is like a trapezoidal safe, which is geometrically designed, and the dimensions were designed by the hydraulics because the carrying capacity or the discharge was about um, 500 cusacks. So the, the trapezoidal side worked out to be 5.2 meter by 3 meter. And even this was, uh, you know, top was to be covered with a slab. And if we add the slab and precast it, then weight was increasing beyond 250. So we decided to remove the top slab, which we can always do it after erection. So we removed the precast slab on the top where vehicles are allowed. And that top slab was designed for class A loading because the length is 15 meter and height is 30 meter tall. It is really difficult for people to maintain. So we wanted vehicle to move on the top of the uh, wire duct and there is a water flowing below on the top of the slab. So we went for slab, again a precast lifted after placing the, uh, the trough on the pier. And uh, this is what some of the strands, what you can see, the pre-tensioning technology was adapted here and some were used for debonding to avoid the, uh, the cracks at the end. And what you can see, the, and most of the tendons, most of the strands were concentrated at the lower portion. And you can see on the top bulb. And that bulb is provided only to support the precast top slab, which we are placing it after erection on the site. This is the reinforcement details. You need not bother too much about it. It goes well with the design issues. And this is what you can see here. And uh, this particular thing, what you see in the lower uh, portion, the, the, the bulb which is coming from the vertical web and the top portion is a precast. And there is a cast in situ stitching done with the trough and the top slab. And that was cast in situ stitching which was carried out. 
and this is a typical cross section of the pier and it was tapering and the maximum was 2.4 at the bottom and the top is 1.2 meter and this was also you know repetitive horizontal repetitiveness whenever there is a difference in the height only the top portion gets executed as uh, the height increases lower portion was added there up and even there mechanization was followed to save the time and how it was constructed you can see this is a casting yard and to lift and place there are two grains of 140 metric ton uh, capacity and we created about 200 meter long two casting yards you can see on the left side there is a jig for reinforcement on the right side there is another jig in the center we have two casting beds which is meant for pretensioned trapezoidal uh, uh, trough and you can see this and this is where the people are uh, uh, placing the reinforcement steel in the vertical web at the bottom and this is a jig this is a completed uh, reinforcement details in the formwork and you can see that once it is placed and there is a pretensioning uh, you have the bars mekale bars all of the pretensioning wires will be brought to 3 or 4 mekale bars and 3 or 4 will be again uh, connected with the jacks which will be pulled up to induce the pretensioning in the strands before concreting and this is what concreting is being done and uh, concreting in process and we have done uh, you know m50 concrete and slump was around 20, 75 to 90 mm using uh, pc based red mixtures and also ggbs was used to 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 get the required uh, slump also and this is the uh, farmwork for the pier which was cast in c2 with m40 grade of concrete again with the ggbs and uh, pc based uh, admixtures and this is some of the sort of things where you can see uh, the farmer which is tailor made the lower portion gets added up as the height increases that is one typical on the right uh, side what you can see and uh, these are some of the uh, slip form uh, piers which are being lifted up as the height increases and uh, this is the uh, central one is the completed pier which is about 36 meters in one of the piers and you can see the top uh, hmm, the pier cap which is ready to take the trough and uh, series of uh, things so what we addressed in this particular thing is the two works the cast in c2 pier erection was done parallelly when casting yard is being done is engaged in production of the troughs and what you can see these are the precast uh, pretensioned uh, troughs which are ready and curing is done there and every seven to nine days we used to produce about 12 to 15 spans you can imagine that is the kind of speed we achieved and this is what you can see in the casting yard, the picture, some of those uh, troughs which are ready for lifting. And uh, this is a Macaulay bar introduced for uh, lifting arrangements because the casting yard is slightly away from the site. So it has to be lifted. And in the next slide, you can see the lifting uh, arrangements uh, on the left side, on the other side, there are two and which will be cranes will be lifting by two ends and placed on a vehicle, which will be carrying till the uh, uh, site, uh, construction site, this is the kind of thing, transportation, what uh, you see there. And you can see also the edges, uh, which is rough because we are going to stitch it on the site, about 450 gap in between the two, two spans, which will be stitched later in the casting C2 M50 concrete. That is why the dowels are left there and unfinished kind of rough surface, what you can see at the edge. And this is being carried forward. And the top picture, you can see some of the already erected one, lower one, uh, it is being uh, transport system. And this is the arrangement. What you can see in the lifting, there are two cranes, uh, one on each side, and uh, each can lift about 150 metric ton, and the total uh, weight turned out to be 225 metric ton, which is being lifted on both sides and being placed on the pier caps below on the top of the bearing. You can see some of these arrangements uh, being lifted and placed, uh, uh, the arrangements after placing. And this is some of the spans which are already being lifted in the behind what you can see. And the next span also is being lifted by two cranes. And this is the stitching arrangements. Uh, let not bother too much about the technicality of it. It's more of a drawing, but you can see here uh, in the central portion, the dowel bars between the two vertical webs of the trap. And that is about 450 after placing. This is on one side and the other side and being stitched with uh, uh, the ready-made uh, moving uh, farm work, which will slide on the a trough itself to the next pier after erection and on the extreme right side you can see after stitching the 450 wide uh, thing what uh, ends up in uh, between the two spans after erection and expansion joint is uh, maintained because of the thermal expansion construction joint and the expansion joints are maintained through like this and water bar is introduced to make it watertight and this is what is tested for the watertightness 
and uh, after erection of all the spans and parallelly the moment uh, few spans uh, got ready then the top slab is being placed uh, on the left side you can see the lifting and one of on the right side you can see it being placed on the the enlarged portion on the right side web you can see that and this is what is the ready constructed uh, uh, the finished uh, wire duct and just to give the quantities the total quantities uh, 1 lakh cubic meter of m50 grade of concrete was utilized for uh, the entire 15.5 kilometer long uh, aqueduct then the total quantity of rebars about 13 ma 13000 metric ton and the total quantity of pretension steel uh, 16000 uh, 1600 metric ton and the time of completion it is almost ready now it is getting finishing uh, touches but uh, the tender period was something more than that about uh, we restricted to 18 months but we were able to complete within 12 months so that we can control the cost overrun the quality which is being also monitored on the precasting yard and the health all the these things have been controlled on our project by completing this and this is now today one of the not one the the longest uh, elevated wire duct carrying water of uh, first of its kind because everywhere you see the post tension structures but we have for gone for a pre-tensioned instead of segmental we have gone for a single one and TOF is mostly uncovered and here we have a covered with uh, vehicular traffic and this is one of the advertisement I'm sorry some of you are not able to read it in Canada this was a paper advertisement given for inaugural and you can see the date 15-8-2017 uh, and today is September and it is almost complete and only small finishing portion is complete so you can say that within uh, 10 to 11 months we are able to complete such a longest in the country and that is because the innovative way of applying the available technology this is what we explored in the government uh, in this particular thing and uh, I should uh, give the credit to the people who are involved the cost of the project is about 280 crores and there's a lot of savings which I should not tell you because otherwise government will ask the contractor to repay back so let us keep that as secret so the tender period was 18 months but uh, we could complete in 12 months and the contractor was one of the good contractors Shankar Narayan construction uh, private limited of Bangalore and the designer was root designers Bangalore and this being the first of its kind in the entire country where pre-tensioning single span with this so we we got it proof checked uh, by one of the famous uh, and the renowned consultant Alok Bhomik some of you people must be knowing about him and after that also we got it vetted by Professor Kishore Chandra at Indian Institute of Science Bangalore so the entire technology planning design everything was vetted before we started the work so this is what how a government was able to apply the innovative technology for solving the problems what traditionally the construction industry uh, is facing okay I would show you uh, the slide for two minutes and that is the end of my journey you'll also be happy I'll also be happy you can see this
Thank you. No questions. <laughs> we dare to. Uh, Arvind, uh, it has been... I know how difficult it is to propose a change in construction industry. But you have done that for a government organization. Not only that, an unheard thing. You are completing the project less, more than six months earlier. I think he needs, and the team needs a standing ovation. Whoever we are here, please give them a standing ovation, which is totally unheard of. Uh, congratulations, and uh, probably I wish the organizers had put this slot when more number of youngsters were present here, and they would have appreciated. Government will also change. Uh, thank you, and very congratulations, Arvind. Uh, let me present a bouquet of flowers and the memento for you. Thank you and see you all tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock.